Good morning. Well, there was a, uh, a girl named Mary, and uh, Mary was having a tough day, so she uh, came home and decided to, uh, to stretch out on the, on the couch, and she thought she would have a well-deserved time of complaining and self-pitying. And so she's moaning to her mom and her brother. She's like, nobody loves me. Everybody in the world hates me. And her brother, you know, he's occupied playing a video game, and he kind of looks up at her, and he gives her these encouraging words. He says, Mary, you see, that's not true, because not everyone in the world knows you. <laughs> this morning, uh, we're going to be talking about encouragement. Uh, I know I'm supposed to be preaching on Thessalonians chapter 5, but I'm going to be focusing less on chapter 5 and more on the overall theme of parts of Thessalonians, which is encouragement. And I think it's something that all of us uh, need to be reminded uh, and encouraged to do from uh, time to time. So before I begin, I'd like to uh, read you guys a poem that I read many years ago. It says this, In a world where bad deeds are celebrated and good deeds relegated, where first place goes to push and shove, and the cost of things is put above the cost of time together, from time to time, the best of us reach out and touch the rest of us. From time to time, the best of us reach out and touch the rest of us. Now, what reason does, does the poet give for why that's important? You see, well, too often, I believe that the world focuses too much on the bad in people's lives. Too often, first place does go to push and shove. And too often, money and things become more important than people. And that's all true, and because that is true, the poet tells us that the best of us should reach out to the rest of us. And of course, everybody wants someone who reaches out to them, right? You see, I love it when people reach out to me. In fact, sometimes, to be honest with you, I prefer it. Sometimes, if it came to whether or not I rubbed your back or you rubbed mine, I would choose mine. You see? <laughs> yeah. I love a good back rub, don't we all? <laughs> you see, we all want someone to reach out to us. We all want somebody who will compliment us, somebody who will root for us, someone who will tell us that we can and will succeed. And we all want somebody who believes in us, right? Now, the Bible tells us that God thinks that this is important for his church, too. It says in Ephesians 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 29, it says, Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may, it may benefit those who listen. In fact, we need to, it goes on in verse 32, we need to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. We ought to be kind to one another. We ought to build each other up. We ought to encourage one another and to strengthen each other. You see, we shouldn't go around saying negative or hurtful, hurtful things to other people. We need to be using our words to lift each other up. I'm always uh, intrigued by, by parents uh, when their kids are really loud indoors and they always tell their children, we, you need to use your indoor voices. Well, in these verses in Ephesians, I believe that they are saying that we need to use our in Jesus voices. We need to use our words to lift up, not tear down. And this command, it's repeated elsewhere in Scripture. In Hebrews 13, verse 3, it says, Encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. And then it says in Hebrews 10, verse 25, Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. See, this is important to God. And God not only expects us to encourage one another, but God himself is willing to show us how it's supposed to be done. I don't often use Greek when I preach. In fact, I never have used Greek before, so I figured I'd take a leap of faith this morning. But I found this intriguing. The, 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 Greek, word, the Greek word translated encourage in these passages that we just read is translated by word parakaleo. Can you guys say it with me? Parakaleo. You see, parakaleo means to call someone alongside. To call someone alongside so that you can encourage and strengthen them. Now, it's really interesting, but in the Gospel of John, Jesus made us all a promise. It says in John 16, verse 7, I tell you the truth, 
It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor, Perikalatos, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. You see, Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit who lives inside of each and every one of us once we become Christians. In Acts 2.38, it says that when we repent and are baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Everybody who is a Christian has the gift of the Holy Spirit inside of them. And the word that Jesus used to describe God's Spirit in the Gospel of John is parakalatos. Parakalatos described someone who comes alongside us. You see, now why does God give us the Holy Spirit? Why does the Holy Spirit come alongside us? You see, God gave us the Holy Spirit to come alongside us, to comfort us, and to encourage us. You see, those are some of the the major roles of the Holy Spirit. You see, God wants us to parakaleo each other. He wants us to come alongside each other. And God sends his spirit, parakalatos, to come alongside us. In other words, God not only believes that we ought to encourage one another, he himself is committed to encouraging us as well. You might be thinking, well, how does does God encourage us? Well, as I first mentioned, he deliberately places his, his spirit inside of each and every single one of us to encourage us. And that Holy Spirit encourages us by reminding us that as Christians that we all belong in Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verses 13 through 14, it says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. You see, the Holy Spirit marks you. And the Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing that you are in Him. The Holy Spirit essentially says that you belong, that you are a child of God, and that you are valuable to Him. Not only does God's Spirit remind us that we are not alone in this world, it reminds us that He is inside of us, and that He will never leave us or forsake us. In Romans 8, 28, in Romans 8, 26 through 28, it says, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Then a couple verses later it says, What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, Who can be against us? See, the Holy Spirit is here to help us. For example, we all have those times where we ought to pray, but we don't really know what to pray for or how we should pray. We see during those times, the Holy Spirit is willing to come and to help us. And oftentimes to help us in such ways that that words aren't even necessary. Because the, the thoughts and the emotions and the intentions of our hearts are directly communicated by the Holy Spirit to the throne of God. If that wasn't enough, God's Spirit prays for us. He is continually interceding for each and every single one of us. And man, because that is true, if God is for us, right, then who in the world can be against us? We are not alone. God's Spirit is inside of you, helping you and praying for you. And so God gives us his spirit to encourage us. And that spirit encourages us by reminding us that we belong and that we're not alone in this world. But that's not all. God has given us one more thing to encourage us in our faith. Romans 15, 4 tells us, Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have You see, God gave us his word to encourage us. And how does that work? One man put it this way. Why should I say I can't when the Bible says I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength? Why should I accept being defeated in life when the Bible says that God always leads me in triumph? Why should I feel like I'm ignorant or uneducated when God promises to generously give me his wisdom when I ask for it? 
Why should I worry and fret when I can cast all my anxiety on Christ who cares for me? Why should I feel alone when God said, I will never leave you or forsake you? Why should I surrender to Satan when he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world? Why should I fear deprivation and loss when I know that God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus? Why should I fear at all when the Bible says, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind? Why should I be afraid of difficult people and circumstances when the Bible declares, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And the list could go on and on, right? The Bible offers us so much hope. There's a parable of a man who was uh, walking alone in the desert. And uh, one day he heard a voice, and this voice was telling him, it said, pick up some pebbles and put them in your pocket. And tomorrow you will be both glad and sorry. And the man obeyed. He stooped over and he picked up a handful of pebbles and he put them in his pocket. And the next morning he woke up and he reached into his pocket and he found diamonds and emeralds and rupees. And you see, he was both glad and sorry. Glad that he had taken some, but sorry that he hadn't taken more. <laughs> right? You see, so often I believe that we as Christians are satisfied with just a handful of pebbles. When in reality, we'd be much richer if we determined to lay a hold of everything that we could find. I believe that too often as Christians, we're just satisfied with just coming here for a one-hour worship service on, on Sunday morning. When we could add so much more. When we could be digging deeper every single day into God's Word. When we could be spending time with God every single day in prayer and solitude. Not to mention small groups or Bible studies and all the other things that we could add into our lives. You see, in the end, we'll be glad for the pebbles that we picked up. But we'll ultimately be saddened that there was so much more that we left behind. And I want to encourage you guys, don't leave anything behind. Spend time into God's word. Getting fed with the hope that he has to offer for us every day. I'd encourage you guys, if you've been thinking about joining uh, the new small group ministry that we're starting here at Faith Community with the AHA series, if, if you've been on the fence about that, about whether or not you should sign up, I'd encourage you to sign up. Those groups are all about digging deeper into God's word and encouraging one another. So if you've thought about it, I would encourage you after the service to sign up. You know, we have uh, a few groups that are, still have spots open, and we'd love to get you connected. So apparently, God believes encouraging and building each other up are extremely important. But why? Why is it so important? What is so important about encouraging one another that God would not only stress its value for us to do, but that he would also commit himself to doing it for us himself? The poem that I read earlier says that this is what better people do. From time to time, the best of us reach out and touch the rest of us. And that's great, right? You see, good people should do that. Good people should encourage and build up others. But that still doesn't answer the question of why it should be done. Why do people need to be encouraged? You see, the answer can be found in the heart of the word that we're discussing today. If we look at the word encourage, what other word do we see inside the word encourage? We see courage, right? You see, to encourage means to put courage in someone else. To discourage means to destroy or take courage out of someone else. And scientific research seems to, uh, to bear that out more. There was a, a psychiatrist, his name was Dr. Henry Goddard. And this guy, he conducted a study on the effects of encouraging. And his test subjects were children. As a part of that study, he, he used an instrument that he called an aerograph. And this instrument was used to measure the uh, energy levels of the students. And what he found is that when, when tired children were given words of praise or encouragement, the aerograph showed that they had an immediate upward surge of new energy. But when tired children were given uh, criticism and when they were discouraged, the aerograph showed immediate downward uh, nosedive of, of energy. You see... So we're designed to need words of encouragement. We're designed to need words of encouragement in order to thrive in this world. And God knows that. 
And of course God knows that because he designed us to need encouragement in our lives. That's why it's so vital to God. That's why he's committed to doing it for us. That's why God is committed to showing us how we can give encouragement to others. We all come to, come to Jesus as damaged goods, right? I mean, the only way that I can come to Jesus is admit and agree that I am a sinner. And man, there are times in my life where my, my guilt and my shame over, overwhelm me so much that all I can do is agree, come to my knees and agree that I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we all come to Christ already as damaged goods. You see, that's why we're here. You don't, we don't need to be torn down anymore. We need to be built up in Jesus Christ. And over the years, I believe that many Christians have failed to understand that. Many Christians have felt that it was their God-given gift to constantly point out the faults and the failures of others. Have you ever known someone like that in your life? I'm sure we've all had those kind of people in our lives. And I'm sure a lot of us have been that some, somebody at some point in our lives. I know I have. I've had times where I've been critical of people. That's why we're here, right? There's a joke I'd like to tell you. There was a guy, he came to his preacher and he said, Preacher, I figured out that I have only one talent. And the preacher looked at, at the man and said, well, well, what is your talent? And the man said, I have the gift of criticism. And the preacher thought about that for a moment, and he said, well, you know, there's the, the parable in the Bible, the parable of the ten talents, and there was the guy who had the one talent, and he went out and buried it. You see, I think that's what you ought to do with yours. <laughs> see, there is, there is no gift of criticism in the Bible. You see, fault-finding is not a Christian virtue. Criticism is not a gift from God. Who is it a gift from? I believe that criticism is a gift from Satan. It's a gift from the evil one, because that's what he does, right? John wrote in Revelation 12, 10, he said, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, Satan, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. Satan is the great criticizer. He is the great fault finder. He is the one who loves to remind us of our shortcomings and our failures. Man, when we're critical to other people, when we don't say good things to them or about them, then I believe that we are in some ways imitating the evil one. Can I get an amen? amen. All right, there we go. There's, a, there's another reason we need to encourage one another, and here's where I get to our text this morning in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, that the day of judgment is coming. It says, The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, Peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly. As labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. And then it goes on to say, But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. So Paul writes to tell us that, that judgment is coming. And it's not coming on us because as Christians we are children of the day. But we need to be living for Jesus until that time comes. And then Paul writes, he says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. In other words, judgment is coming. And we shouldn't allow each other to stand alone in this wicked world that is going to be destroyed. The sinfulness of this world can harden us. But the sinful of this world can drag us down. And we need to take that seriously. We need to encourage one another so that won't happen. I can't say this enough. We need to encourage one another. And God calls us, he calls us to minister to one another by encouraging and building each other up. And our goal in that ministering should be the same as God's. We need to encourage one another, but we need to encourage one another the same way that God does. I'm going to repeat this again. How does God encourage us? God encourages us by reminding us that we belong, by reminding us that we are not alone in this world. 
And by reminding us that there are things that he can tell us through his word that will help us live with more hope. See, that's what we need to do. And in this church, we need to make sure that everybody realizes that they belong here. From the richest doctor to the poorest person on the street. It shouldn't matter what someone looks like. It shouldn't matter what they've done or who they are. We need to make sure that as a church, that as faith community, that everybody who walks through those doors realizes that they belong here. And in this church, we also need to remind each other that we're not in this alone. We all go through tough times in our life. We all have struggles. But as a church, we need to be there for each other during those times. We need to be praying for one another. We need to be praying for each other's spiritual, physical, financial needs. Most importantly, we need to be there for each other when that person is going through a hard time. Be there just to listen. Be there just to understand what they are going through. Be there just to have them be able to, to talk with you. And in this church, we need to remind each other that our ultimate encouragement comes from God's word and from God's commands and from his promises. I believe there's nowhere else in the world where, where people can find the words of life rather than from the words of God. We need to treat each other the way that Jesus treats us. And in so doing so, we'll encourage each other and build each other up so that we can be healed of the disease of sin that I believe has damaged our souls. I want to end with this story. There's a uh, psychiatrist in New York City named John Rosen, and he works with uh, catatonics. And most doctors who work with catatonics prefer to remain uh, separate and aloof from their patients. But John, he, he moves in to the ward with them, and he places his bed among theirs, and he lives the life that they must live. There might be days where they don't talk, and he doesn't talk as well. You see, day to day, John loves them, and he shares life, day to day life with them. It's as if he understands what is happening. He's just there. What John does is he communicates something to them that these patients haven't heard in years. That somebody cares about them. And that somebody understands. But then John, he does something else. He puts his arms around them. And he hugs them. This guy's an MD. He has a PhD. He's a highly skilled physician. But he has become like God to his patients. And he holds these unattractive, unlovable, and sometimes incontinent persons and loves them back into life. And oftentimes, when they finally speak, the first words that they say is, thank you. You see, that's the kind of encouragement that God calls us to show to each other and to the world. And I want to encourage you this morning. Maybe there's somebody in your life that you've been pretty critical of lately. Well, I would encourage you to go encourage them. And I would encourage all of us to really become a church, you know, where everyone feels like they belong. I think we're doing a great job with that, but we need to continue to be reminded of that. And to continue to remind each other that we're not in this alone. Let us pray. Dear God, we uh, thank you so much for this morning. God, we just thank you for the opportunity to, to come here and to worship you. God, I pray that all of us would be encouraged to go out and to show your love to people. God, I pray that as a church, we would be encouraged to create a church where everybody feels like they belong. God, I pray that we would all be encouraged to know that because of you and because of each other and because of this church, we're not in this world alone. Whatever it is we're going through, God, whatever struggles we have, God, I pray that everyone would, here would know that we're not in this alone. And God, we thank you for your words. God, we thank you for the hope that, that the Bible gives us each and every single day. And I pray that all of us would be encouraged to, to not leave anything behind, God, but to grab a hold of everything, every opportunity that you give us to dig deeper into your word and to grow closer to you. God, we love you and we thank you for everything. In your name I pray, amen.